We're joined by Sophie Box Bostock today, who is going to talk to us about um, sleep in uncertainty. So there is uh, lots of anxiety and stress amongst many, many people. And I think we've all noticed our sleep has been really um, impacted during this time. So we are very, very um, excited to have Sophie join us today to tell us about um, how we can really improve our sleep during this time. So Sophie, I am going to hand over to you and uh, look forward to chatting to you throughout this, this talk. Amazing. Well, thanks everyone for joining. Um, it's a great privilege to be part of this platform. I have been given quite a lot of uh, sleep advice and maybe this is a small intimate group because everybody has, has managed to nail sleep. I feel this is unlikely, but I wanted to do a quick check. So before we start, I'm actually gonna launch our first poll. Um, this is obviously a technical experiment. I'm hoping that you can see a poll in front of you, nod your head if you can. Um, and the question is, what changes of your, in your sleep have you noticed? So this is, particularly since uh, the coronavirus uh, pandemic started. Um, and we've got lots of options here. Someone's voted, awesome. You can vote for more than one. I can't vote because I'm the host, but- um, You can I'm, tell me. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm going to tell you while everyone's thinking about it. <laughs> yeah, really I definitely have difficulty falling um, asleep. And um, I have had some weird dreams too. Yep, I've had some of those. and. Um, yeah, I think waking up in the middle of the night. I check. I check if the door is locked every night. So that, that those would be my three. Okay. Well, I will. Um, thank you for those of you who who who've voted. This is kind of a technical experiment. I'm going to end the poll now. Unfortunately, I can't add P's responses, but I can share the responses with you guys. Um, so we've got waking up feeling tired and unrefreshed um, as something that's affected everyone. Some people sleeping more than normal um, and others waking up more unable to fall asleep and more aware of dreams. So hopefully we will reveal the reasons for these things happening over the course of the next sort of 20 minutes or so please feel free to fire questions as we go along um, i'm going to share some slides just to give us a little bit of a visual cue um, the session is about sleeping with uncertainty although it's relevant now i really hope that the advice insights in this presentation will be relevant for you whatever situation that you're dealing with that's kind of a bit stressful because even when we come out of this in your future life you're always going to have to tackle these situations where things are a bit out of your control so hopefully uh, these insights will be relevant for some time to come so that was the poll <clears throat> um a rough outline of what i'm going to cover why are my sleep patterns up the creek uh then I'll spend a little bit of time talking about the science of what controls when and how well we sleep. Because if you understand that, actually the next part, which is all about the techniques that you can use, the strategies to improve sleep, become actually quite obvious. Um, so by the time I've gone through the second section, all the techniques will start to sort of make sense. And we'll have plenty of time for, for Q&A at the end. Um, so sleep, what happens when we sleep? Uh, well, if we were to plug electrodes into this delightful koala's skull while he slept, we would realize that sleep is an incredibly active process. I know it doesn't look like it, but if we were to measure the electrical impulses feeding off his brain, we'd actually have lots of different stages of sleep and we can map these into something called a hypnogram. So stage one sleep, uh, this is what happens when you've been on a webinar for about 37 minutes and your kind of your eyelids start to close. It's that transition phase between sleep and wake. Um, it usually only lasts, lasts kind of five to 10 minutes. And then we get into stage two sleep which is also called true sleep. It's when your heart rate slows, your blood pressure slows down, your breathing rate slows down, and your brain starts to consolidate memories. It's also very important for your concentration. We know that even slipping into stage two sleep for 10 or 15 minutes is enough to pep up your levels of alertness and mood. So the power nap typically has a bit of stage one and a bit of stage two sleep. Then, if we're lucky, we will transition after about 35, 40 minutes into stage three sleep. This is the deep, physically restorative phase of sleep. It's very difficult to rouse someone when they're in stage three sleep. 
I should say that there will be a quiz on this. So I hope you're paying attention. Um, in stage three, we produce growth hormone. Uh, this is not just important for helping us grow, but also for immune function um, and for restoring damaged muscles as well. So super physically restorative. Then we swing back, as you can see, uh, we swing sort of back through stage two, possibly a bit of stage one into REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. And when you look at the electrical signatures, being awake and REM sleep are actually quite similar. And what we think, one of the things that's going on during REM sleep, which is usually associated with dreaming, is that our brains are kind of running through, replaying memories from the day and trying to slot them into our long-term memory banks. So we essentially move short-term memories from the kind of short-term storage in an area called the hippocampus into the huge kind of cortex so that we can store things in the longer term. REM sleep also incredibly important for our emotional balance. So we process negative emotions in particular during REM sleep. We know that if you've had more trauma, you're likely to have quite kind of vivid and intense dreams. And a lot of people since the pandemic have started have noticed that they are having more sort of fantastical dreams. Lots of reasons for that. It may be just the intensity of the emotion, but also, um, if you notice on this uh, hypnogram, in the first half of the night, we tend to have more of that deep stage three sleep. So you're less likely to get woken up. In the second half of the night, you have more REM sleep. Now, if you are less disciplined than you might otherwise have been, and you are dozing in the morning, you're more likely to have more time for a bit of REM sleep. So lots of, lots of factors uh, underpinning changes in dreams. So that is normal sleep. This would be sleep for a normal young adult. The other thing that you might notice here is that there are a couple of periods of wakefulness in between these sleep cycles. So each of these cycles probably takes around 90 to 110 minutes. They vary a little bit in length. In between the cycles, you have a brief period of wakefulness. Now, most of us just roll over, fall back to sleep again, not even aware that we've been awake. But as soon as you start to worry about sleep and become more conscious about it, these natural periods of wakefulness can be a little bit disturbing. And I think that's something that's, that's um, happened to a lot of people recently. So that's normal sleep. But what happens when our koala friend senses danger? And this is where the uh, <clears throat> quiz element comes in. It's not too difficult. From an evolutionary perspective, if you sense danger, which is the stage of sleep which you think you could probably do without? Answers on a postcard or in the chat, or you can just unmute. Which stage of sleep are you going to lose if you are in danger? I'm getting, I'm getting a response here. Let's check in with the chat. Three, deep sleep, 100%, full marks. Okay, so the way that the brain responds to uncertainty is actually to make your sleep lighter. So we spend less time in deep sleep so that we can very quickly wake up, be aroused. What actually happens is that our level of overall alertness, vigilance increases both during the day and during the night. So that's our koala friend, obviously, as human beings, we don't necessarily even need to see danger. We can sense danger in lots of different ways. And um, particularly uh, since the pandemic started, there's been a lot of kind of social contagion. You know, you go onto, uh, you go online, you see people worrying about things, you go into the supermarket, you see that the shelves are empty. And even though that's not a direct threat to you, your brain is working overtime, uh, getting anxious, thinking that you could be under threat. And the impact on the brain is to alert this area called the amygdala, which controls your, your emotions, your emotional balance. And it's also responsible for kickstarting our stress response. I'm sure you've heard this before, but the fight or flight stress response is an evolutionary mechanism which is designed to help us survive. And it's designed to help us move in particular. 
So when we switch on the stress response, our heart rate in increases, we produce adrenaline, we produce cortisol, which releases loads of glucose into the bloodstream. It's designed to fire us up, ready to move. Absolutely brilliant when you're running away from a fire or a lion, but utterly useless if you're sitting on your sofa worrying about where you're next going to be able to purchase some toilet rolls. So this evolutionary adaptive response actually makes us ready to move at a time when we've been told to stay in. So we've got all this kind of pent up energy uh, and tension, which many of us are not able to release through sort of physical movement. Um, the other thing that the brain does, because it's in crisis mode and it's much more concerned about where the next meal is coming from than long term plans, is it down regulates the activity in the prefrontal cortex. And this is the part of your brain which is responsible for rational thought and self control. And so you find yourself worrying and getting stuck in habit loops and worry loops with less sort of uh, self-control, less regulation of your emotions. And it's not just emotions, it's also your behavior. You've got less capacity to stick to your goals. And so we become more impulsive. Uh, and so if there are, do happen to be any high fat calorie, high fat calorie snacks around, we're much more likely to succumb to our temptations because our willpower is just a little bit lower and we're feeling like we're a bit more impulsive. Um, I see a few people nodding, hopefully this makes sense, but just to drive it home, this can become a bit of a negative cycle. So we start off unable to sleep well, we feel a bit more anxious, impulsive, and then this has knock-on impacts on our behavior. And there are lots of different ways that it can affect behavior, but one of them, um, perhaps more caffeine because you're tired during the day, so you drink more caffeine, which peps you up, as we'll see, uh, we'll see why in a minute. Um, but I think more prevalent is probably digital addiction. So this is a particularly unhelpful mechanism uh, for coping with feeling anxious, but perfectly natural. You want reassurance, you want news. The way that your brain decides whether it needs to be anxious about something is to replay past experiences. But we don't, none of us have had a past experience of coronavirus. So we seek out more information. We want reassurance. So to keep checking your phone is perfectly natural. Unfortunately, because it helps keep you awake at night, it actually leads to further increases in tension and arousal. Um, over time, this can lead to lower concentration and productivity and can exacerbate feelings of stress, depression, burnout. And if it goes on for week upon week, month upon month, uh, then you start to believe that you're never going to be able to sleep again. And this is what happens in insomnia, when sleep itself actually becomes a source of stress. And often people, even just walking into their own bedroom, can feel quite stressful because they're so used to the frustration of not being able to sleep. And the cycle can go both ways. It might start with poor sleep, it might start with an emotional problem, uh, but the two can kind of feed off each other. This sounds pretty, pretty nasty, and it can be, but the good news is that you can address this cycle at pretty much any point, because the relationships between sleep and mental health are absolutely interconnected. And the good news is that if you do improve your sleep, very quickly you can reduce that sense of anxiety give yourself more energy and give yourself the capability to kind of follow through on the behavioral goals uh, that are important to you does that make sense i will pause there yes okay great um so what controls when and how well we sleep this is once you understand what i um will explain over the next five minutes you you will be able to master sleep. Okay, this is a big promise. <laughs> um, okay, so what happens over the course of a normal 24 hours to our sleepiness and alertness? Well, it tends to follow a pattern a little bit like this. So we get more and more alert through the morning, we have a little bit of a lull after lunch, nothing to do with having eaten pasta for lunch. This is a natural circadian dip in our energy levels. Things pick up as we head towards sort of happy hour, five, six, seven o'clock. And then 
usually things start to slide. As it gets dark, obviously our energy levels start to be depleted and we tend to sleep. Now the time at which this cycle happens is a little bit different for everyone. You might find yourself an early bird, you wake up at six o'clock in the morning and you very quickly become alert. Or you could be somebody that actually genuinely doesn't feel alert until after 10 o'clock. So this is partly genetically controlled, but it can be influenced uh, by what we call Zeitgebers or time givers, because this rhythm is controlled by two systems. Firstly, your body clocks. Now you all will have probably heard of the body clock or circadian rhythm. We used to kind of think that it was all about one master clock in the brain. There is one master clock, but actually we probably have 37 trillion body clocks all over the body. Every single cell in your body is programmed through DNA to operate on a 24 hour rhythm. Now, when all of these different clocks operate on the same rhythm, you are on fire. This is when your body is operating efficiently, you've got loads of energy, but you've probably, if you've ever experienced jet lag, you know what happens when the clocks start to become disrupted. Your stomach is actually operating on a slightly different rhythm to your liver, for example. If you exercise late at night, you probably find that your muscles are actually on a different rhythm to uh, your stomach. So what we need is for all of our body clocks to be in sync. So we rely on these signals. And the most powerful signal is light, is daylight. So daylight, first thing in the morning, wakes up your body clock, tells this kind of master clock in the brain through receptors that land on the back of the eye that it's daytime, it's time to be alert. And the same thing happens, or the opposite thing happens as it gets dark. As we turn down the lights, the signal to your brain allows the production of a hormone called melatonin, which signals to the rest of the body that it's time to ready for bed. So melatonin is just a kind of signaling hormone, which is listening to you know, what's in your environment. Light is an incredibly powerful regulator of all these body clocks, but there are others. Uh, so quick question. Do you know of any other Zeitgebers? What other things which naturally can be found in your environment which will change your energy levels or things that you can do to shift your body clock? Any ideas? And I'll give you a clue. The answer is not caffeine. Uh, I'm going to come on to caffeine just now. <laughs> I can't, I can't get at the chat, so I don't know if you've responded. Everyone's looking a little bit confused. Yep, we've got some responses coming in. So okay, you've got sorry, smell, temperature, breathing techniques, regular patterns. Okay, okay, good work. Um, none of them are actually correct, but excellent effort. Uh, so Zeitgebers, we tend to think about light on the one hand, the other ones, I'm sure somebody said this, but food, food is a really strong signal to your body clock that it's time to be alert. And this is one of the problems with eating late at night. You're sending a message to your body that it's daytime. And so it makes it harder to sleep. As well as the fact that your stomach isn't ready to digest food when you eat it late at night. You actually metabolize it differently. You're more likely to store energy as fat when you eat late at night. Um, so you're more likely to go and wait. Ah, oh, side, side issue. Okay, so exercise, we've got food. Um, oh, I, I just gave away, hang on, exercise. Exercise is another sake caper. We have light, we have food, and exercise. Exercise is a natural energizer. Um, and I was talking to P earlier, who did some ferocious rowing last week, late at night, and was unable to sleep for some hours afterwards. And this is partly because uh, of the sort of adrenaline, cortisol, gets your heart rate going also increases your body temperature and your body temperature cooling is one of the stimuli that your body relies on to tell it that it's time for sleep so for an evolutionary perspective when we were out living in the savannah after sunset 
the temperature for the environment cooled and this was uh, a cue for the body as like Gaber that it was time to sleep so if you get too hot before bed it can really interfere um, so I usually recommend that people keep their bedrooms a bit cooler than normal room, room temperature okay so that's body clocks uh, the second system that controls your sleep a bit less complicated it's just called sleep pressure and it builds up during the day the longer you have been awake the more you need to sleep that's it and it's like a kind of fail-safe mechanism because no matter what's happening to the light let's say that you live in an environment where it's light all the time sleep pressure is your body's protective mechanism that says well whatever happens you're still gonna to need to sleep. And it's actually the buildup of waste product called adenosine, which builds up in the brain and makes you feel drowsy. But there is a very simple way to block the adenosine with the very popular drug, which Bella is not consuming because she's consuming mint tea. Any ideas? <laughs> Caffeine. Caffeine. <laughs> okay. Um, yes. Awesome. Um, so basically this adenosine, it's, it's always building up in your brain, but you can mask its effects by consuming coffee. Um, so caffeine basically just kind of gets in the way of the adenosine receptors and fools the brain into thinking that you're not sleepy, which is fine until the caffeine degrades. And then you just get hit by this wall of adenosine. You feel incredibly drowsy. And so the next thing that you think is, I need another cup of coffee. And it's quite hard not to kind of get into this cycle uh, if you're not quite getting enough sleep. Dun, dun, dun. So at any one time, your sleepiness and alertness is the product of this circadian alerting signal, keeping you awake, and sleep pressure telling you to sleep. So that's it. I mean, that really is kind of all you need to know, um, because all of the advice about sleep is about learning to manipulate these two systems and getting them working for you. Um, so I am going to try with uh, the aid of technology um, to launch another poll. Dun, dun, dun. Um, you want me to do it, Sophie? Yeah, I'm, I've, unfortunately, I have got stuck with my visual screen. Aha, okay, I think I've got it now. Um, so given what we've just talked about, it would be great to know from people what you think has got in the way of your sleep. If you have noticed some of these um, changes that we mentioned right at the start, what's your best guess on the stuff that has interfered with your sleep because i'm sure that there are a lot of factors at play yeah i think that a lot of us are experiencing those worries keeping us awake at night worries about the it's, un, it's the uncertainty i think that's that's the word i hear a lot from people is that they just don't know what's going to happen. And even on Sunday, where we're waiting for <clears throat> news from Boris Johnson, nobody knows. There's lots of speculation. And I think that th those worries are keeping lots of people away. Yeah. And if we go back to that um, image of the brain where we've got kind of this dialed up amygdala in any sort of uncertainty, the brain responds by sort of becoming more sensitive to danger. And so we're looking for danger anywhere. Um, if you're not sleeping well, the consequence for the brain is that you actually dial up the sensitivity of the, of the amygdala. So if your sleep is a bit screwed up, uh, then you're gonna be feeling more anxious than normal. And so one of the defenses is just to say, do you know what, I didn't get a great night's sleep last night. Um, I'm, I'm just gonna kind of check in with myself. Is it logical and um, rational to be worried about the things that I'm worried about? Or actually could sleep be kind of interfering and causing a bit of an amygdala hijack? Um, and just knowing this about your brain can be quite helpful. Um, so uh, we got the results in. 
yeah lots of worries lots of worries lack of routine not enough physical activity absolutely so physical activity helps to build up that sleep pressure so when you haven't done enough during the day and you're not feeling sleepy it might just be worth not going to bed if you don't feel sleepy stay up for a little bit longer it's much better than going to bed early and not actually feeling tired that can lead to anxiety and frustration about sleep so if there's no not enough sleep pressure perhaps you had a bit of a lion in the morning um, then only go to bed when you're sleepy tired that's really really important um, Okay, so let's just go on. I've got a few kind of uh, tips which I think are helpful at any time. Um, certainly routine. You will have heard it before, but the reason that routine is so important is because it really helps your body clocks to stay in sync with each other. Um, but that picture kind of disturbed me because the clock is right next to the bed. And if you're someone who wakes up in the middle of the night, you'll know that one of the first things that you do is look at that clock. And very rarely is it actually reassuring you in any way. If it's early in the night, then you go, oh, why have I woken up? And if it's late in the night, you go, oh, I'm never, I'm never going to get enough sleep to feel refreshed in the morning. Just let it go. If the alarm hasn't gone off, then you can just go back to sleep. It doesn't matter what time it is. Uh, and if you're an anxious sleeper, you will resist that. But honestly, try it. Try it for a week and see whether it makes a difference. Um, second thing, uh, work by a window. Amazingly, um, because of our sensitivity to natural daylight, if you are next to a window all day, research suggests that you actually sleep for 40 minutes longer than someone who is working in an office, for example, that doesn't have exposure to natural light. And so wherever your workspace is at home, think about whether or not you can get, get more exposure to light. And if not, then just going outside. 10 minutes at a time in your breaks, soaking in the sunlight um, can be really helpful to reduce that feeling of fatigue that you're getting in the morning and make you feel more alert. Similarly, in terms of routine, regular meal times, it's not just about the time that you get up and go to sleep. If you help to keep your body clocks in sync by eating breakfast, lunch and dinner at similar times, your Appetite hormones are able to anticipate when you're going to eat. You'll feel hungry at the same time. You'll be able to digest more efficiently. Um, but definitely stop eating two hours before bed if you can. Um, and I love this picture. It just makes me feel hungry. Um, but the wine is there to remind me that alcohol is not great for sleep. Um, although it has, tends to have the effect of relaxing you, it's a kind of a sedative it actually interferes with that natural sleep architecture that we looked at before. Um, so it actually disrupts your deep sleep um, and also disrupts your REM sleep. So there's less of that kind of emotionally balancing going on during the night and your sleep becomes more fragmented. So you wake up and you still feel more fatigued than you would do if you hadn't had any alcohol. And finally, in the bedroom, um, this looks like a nice bedroom, looks fairly tidy, but uh, it wouldn't win any prizes from a sleep expert. It does not have any um, blinds or curtains on it. And keeping the room really dark can really help with the quality of your sleep. Obviously, when your eyelids are closed, you can still sense light. Um, that's how we know that it's daytime at the moment. Uh, you are more, much more sensitive to light than you might have thought. And the more daylight you've got, you've had exposure to during the day, actually the less sensitive you'll be to um, light at night. So we know that people who get plenty of daytime exposure to light, they're less likely to have their sleep disrupted by phones before bed, for example. But if you've been inside all day, your body clocks are very confused. They're very sensitive to that evening light. Um, final thing, and then we'll definitely uh, open it up for questions. Um, so this final lot of uh, recommendations are really about how to get your mindset into the right frame of mind for sleep. I know that worries are keeping a lot of people awake at night. 
If you're a parent, you will know that having a good bedtime routine can be really valuable for your kids. You can't just take a running toddler and put them into bed and tell them to sleep. It doesn't work. So what do you do? You kind of coax them through it. You have a series of rituals, uh, whether it's having a bath and a story and brushing their teeth to ready them for bed. And adults can, be, can benefit in exactly the same way. We need a transition from the 110 miles an hour of the day to actually readying the mind and the body for sleep. So protecting that time and often encourage very busy people to set an alarm on their phone an hour before they actually want to sleep. And that is to remind them to switch everything off, to switch their phones off, TVs off and actually just, you know, get ready for bed. Maybe have a hot bath, uh, do some relaxation. Reading a book just for six minutes can be enough to relax your muscles and calm down the mind. It doesn't need to be for a very long time. I'm happy to talk more about relaxation techniques uh, if anyone's interested. Um, but particularly valuable exercise, if it's thoughts that are keeping you awake, is actually to make time to deal with those thoughts during the day. So schedule a time in your calendar, maybe just for 15 minutes, say at 4 p.m., that you can call, literally coin worry time in your calendar. And all you need to do is write down all the things that you're worried about. I mean, literally delight in them. List, write, list a whole long list. And some of them might be crazy things. Uh, some of them might be small things. Some of them might be big things. But get them out. The more that you can write them down, take them from this kind of ruminating place in your mind onto the page, the better. And then you can look down your list and give a, do a little exercise in what can you control and what can you not control. And if your worries are pretty major, you know, what's the economic impact of coronavirus going to be? When are things going to go back to normal? Those are big worries. They're not things that you have control over right now. So put them on one side, accept that they are worrying, but they're not things that you need to dwell on. You can always schedule more time to think about them tomorrow in your worry time session. The stuff you can focus on are the worries which are quite practical. You know, if you're worried about what's the impact of this going to be on my kids, well, then talking to them about it, making sure that you structure time so that you're doing more homeschooling, whatever it is, certain things will be will have actions that you can take. And so doing a little bit of problem solving for the stuff that's in your control and just letting the other stuff go can be really helpful for, for structuring those worries. Um, moving to actually when you're in bed, if you've still got quite an active mind, but you really know that you're tired, it's time to switch off. At the moment, we're not able to travel anywhere except when we close our eyes. And so it can be really helpful to whisk yourself away to actually one of your favorite places. Might be a beach, might be your ideal home. But as you close your eyes, take yourself and immerse yourself in this place and focus really deeply on what it's like to be there. What does it sound like? What can you smell? What can you hear? Can you feel the warmth of the sun on your back and the feeling of sound beneath your feet? Oh, I can almost feel myself there now. Um, but it's a really nice way, even if you're not asleep, at least you're enjoying the experience of relaxing in bed. And more often than not, if you keep returning to that same place, the more often you revisit, the more quickly your mind knows, oh, okay, I'm relaxing now. So it's worth practicing. Um, and then if you wake up in the middle of the night and you just, you're probably feeling a little bit groggy and you just want to prevent more thoughts throwing themselves at you, uh, then you can try the very simple thought blocking technique. All you do is you say to yourself the word, the. Two seconds later, say it again. The. The. And because the is so boring, it's literally the most boring word in the English language. Um, 
it doesn't usually have any emotional connotations for people. It can be a really helpful, just temporary blocker to just keep other thoughts away. It doesn't usually work uh, before you go to sleep, I found, because your kind of mind is more active. But if you're kind of semi-awake, semi-asleep, it can be just enough to get you back to sleep. The final thing I'd say before we just uh, open it up to questions, um, and I've mentioned this already, but the most important thing is not to worry too much about sleep. The more you worry about it, the harder it is to find. Sleep is a natural process. If your body and your mind need to sleep and you're calm and you're comfortable in bed, then sleep will come. And if it's not coming, stop trying. You know, if you've been in bed for 15 or 20 minutes, can't sleep, get up, get out of bed, go somewhere else, read a book and don't beat yourself up about it. You know, at the moment, there's a lot of anxiety. Our routines are up the creek. It might just be better to stay awake for a little bit longer until you're really tired and only then get back into bed. You want to preserve this relationship between you, your bed and a kind of restful sleep. So keep frustration out of the bedroom. There you go. Um, okay, so that's that's the the meat of it that I was going to cover. Um, any questions? I don't know if any have already come in. I had a quick one on um, on baths because you said that getting hot before or sort of doing workout and getting hot before bed is bad for you. But then so many people have hot baths before bed. And, and what? Great question. No, um, baths are great. Um, so counterintuitively, in fact. So you're absolutely right. You don't want to get too hot before bed, but actually a warm bath or shower does two things. One is that actually as you get out of the warm bath or shower, you've got this kind of rapid body cooling going on, which probably is very helpful to sleep. But also there's an effect where if you're lying in hot water, in order to cool yourself down, the core body temperature actually decreases as you send your blood flow to the outside of your body in an attempt to kind of cool you down so the impact is actually that your core body temperature can fall a little bit so there was a review published not that long ago that suggested that a long hot bath an hour to 90 minutes before you sleep is probably the best thing for sleep so allowing a lot enough time for your body to cool down afterwards Brilliant. Hot baths all round. <laughs> um, we've got a question that's come in from Lisa on the chat. Um, she's wondering about techniques uh, for sleep for shift workers. Um, this, was, is, this is really something very interesting because you were talking about daylight and, and, and the impact of that. So what, what are ways to convince the body that sleep is needed during the day and how to transition out of a period of night shifts to day shifts again? really hard um and it but it does come back to these zeitgebers so i mentioned light i mentioned food and exercise another one is actually social contact um social contact can be very energizing or, or also de-energizing um so if you're coming out of a night shift uh actually recommend that you use uh, sunglasses, dark glasses on your commute home so that you are reducing the exposure to light. Um, allow enough time to kind of let the body calm down from what you've been doing, particularly at, at the moment, you know, healthcare workers, incredibly kind of uh, activating work right now. So don't get straight into bed you know, allow time for your, for your eyes to start to feel tired, make sure you dim the lights. Um, a lot of it is practical. It's about communicating with the rest of the family or other people in the house, maybe putting a note on the door saying, you know, someone's asleep here. Can you please keep the noise down? Um, because your sleep during the day will be lighter than it is at night. That's just because of our circadian rhythms. It's much harder to sleep during the day, even when you're super, super tired. Uh, so it becomes more important to use um, earplugs, to use eye masks, to try and kind of protect that sleep. And then once you've uh, had a bit of a sleep, if you wake up naturally, then trying to get outdoors and doing a little bit of activity, some exercise, so that that will overall improve the quality of your sleep. Um, I can't kind of go into all the different shift patterns, but essentially it's about using zeitgebers. Talking of exercise, um, is there a better time of day to exercise? Because see, if you're exercising very late at night, you're kind of 
awakening the, the body up again. You think you're going to be exhausting yourself by doing lots of exercise, but actually it has the opposite effect. So would you have any recommendations as to the time, best time of day to exercise? Yeah, so it's, it's interesting. If you are a natural night owl um, and you're trying to wake up earlier in the morning, then there was research that's shown that if you exercise first thing in the morning, it helps to shift your body clock forward. It will help you to feel more naturally tired uh, earlier in the evening. Um, having said that, it depends on the exercise that you're doing. Because of all these circadian rhythms, uh, we know that actually your speed and um, concentration tends to increase through the day. So we know that a lot of world records tend to be broken, sort of speed records tend to be broken between three and five o'clock in the afternoon, when actually most people's body strength is actually a bit stronger. So if you are trying to get a PB at the gym, probably you're going to be better at it in the afternoon than you would be in the morning. Um, so it does depend on where you can fit it in during your day. But if you do exercise first thing in the morning, one really important thing to note is that your body temperature will be at an all time low. So properly allowing time to warm up. Otherwise, you're more likely to get an injury. And talking of mornings, Julia's um, interested to know is um, she's heard that the serotonin levels are lower in the morning, which can con contribute to a morning low. Is that actually a thing? Uh, yeah, we have we have hormonal patterns. Pretty much every hormone that we have has a circadian rhythm, um, and so yeah, absolutely. I can't uh, I can't put my finger on the serotonin rhythm, but it's partly responsive to daylight. So if you've had a night of darkness, then yeah, your serotonin levels are going to be low. I think uh, mood tends to improve during the day, which would fit with an increase in serotonin during the day. Um, so yeah. It's part of a natural rhythm. And one of the great things about this kind of quieter lockdown time is that you have potentially, if you're working from home or you're on furlough, you've got a little bit more scope to learn about your body's natural rhythm and try and be a bit more sensitive to it. If you start to go to sleep when you're sleepy and wake up without an alarm, you might actually find that A, you, you're more of an early bird than you thought, or perhaps the other way around. Um, and B, you might not need that much more sleep than you were already getting. For a lot of people, they may be building up a bit of a sleep debt during the week, during the normal working week, so that they end up catching up at the weekend and having a bit of a lie-in. But if you work out what your sleep window is now, then when you do go back to work and regular routines, hopefully you can protect that amount of sleep going forward. Is there an optimum number of hours for sleeping at, at night? Because you, you talked about sleep debt there and, and the hope that people think, well, I'll just catch up at the weekend, but it doesn't necessarily work like that. So what, what is the kind of optimum number of hours? So lots of research suggesting that uh, for adults, between seven and nine hours is recommended. Certainly really interesting studies that have looked at immune function, uh, suggesting that at least seven hours seems to be protective. So one study, for example, that um, looked at the common cold virus and they took a bunch of volunteers and they put them up in a hotel and gave them free food and they were utterly delighted until they inoculated them all with the common cold virus. And uh, over the course of seven days, Days, they looked to see who developed a cold and it turned out that those people who had been sleeping for more than seven hours before the experiment started were four times less likely to get a cold than those people who slept for fewer than six hours. So that's a rhinovirus rather than a coronavirus. The two don't necessarily marry up, but we do know that um, your immune function is stronger uh, if you have had enough sleep. So everybody's different, but a minimum of seven hours, I'd say, for most people. You spoke um, a little earlier about um, food. And there's a question on the chat again about nutrition. So um, we've also had a nutritionist on the Motivation Isolation platform talking about um, whether um, having food an hour or a small amount of protein an hour before going to bed can actually be beneficial for sleep. So are, are nutrition and diet sort of linked intrinsically to sleep and quality of sleep? Absolutely. Really interesting area for research. I mean, just like every area of science, actually, understanding the microbiome and what's going on in our gut and the relationship between that and our sleep is quite an undiscovered area, I'd say. Um, there are certain nutritional deficiencies which have been linked to uh, less good sleep. Um, 
the evidence is not very strong. In terms of improving your sleep, the best evidence that we have is for an approach called cognitive behavioral therapy. And essentially all of the advice that I've talked about today is based on either the cognitive techniques or the behavioral techniques to get people's uh, sleep patterns back on track. So if you've got some kind of a restriction in your diet that means that you're deficient in something, for example, like vitamin D or magnesium, you might find that supplements can be helpful. Um, but generally speaking, the best evidence, most robust evidence is for these more kind of behavioral and cognitive approaches to improving sleep. So would there be foods that you would recommend or wouldn't or would recommend avoiding um, to improve sleep? Um, I think avoiding uh, certainly spicy foods. Um, we know that around about sort of two hours before bed, for most people, maybe about nine o'clock, the stomach actually produces a whole load of acid. Um, and this is probably some kind of self cleansing ritual that, you know, traditionally we wouldn't sleep, we would, sorry, we wouldn't eat after that. But it means that if you do eat late at night, and particularly if you eat very acidic or spicy foods that can interact with that acid, you're much more likely to get reflux, which can really interfere with your sleep. So in general, just not eating too much uh, before you go to bed is the best approach. So everybody wants to be cautious about those late night curries and kebabs on a Saturday night, then I think it's probably... Washed down with a few beers. When I think about my student lifestyle, I'm surprised that I got any sleep at all. I can absolutely, I can absolutely uh, agree with that. Um, Sophie, this has been so, so interesting for everybody. I'm conscious of time and, and that everybody may now need to get on to um, their, their next things in their day. Um, I, it's great that you've shared your contact details there, so um, thank you for those. For anybody who does want to know um, a little bit more about sleep or wants to go, uh, wants to get a bit deeper, then I know Sophie is very, very happy to, um, to hear from you. So please do get in, in touch with her there and you can follow her. She's very active on LinkedIn particularly. Um, she obviously got her own website and then on some social media there's um, various tips and things that um, Sophie often shares about sleep. So um, thank you very, very much, Sophie, for, for joining us. And thank you, everybody, for coming along. As I mentioned, we are going to be sharing um, this with you from, um, uh, for in a couple of days' time. We have recorded it, so you'll be able to, to watch it back. And do share it with any friends and family and colleagues that you also think may also be sh um, struggling with sleep. Um, as well. So do have a look back on the um, event page for more events coming up from um, on the Motivation and Isolation platform. We've got lots coming up um, over the next couple of weeks um, and whatever happens with lockdown I think we'll, st we'll still keep going with this series and do watch back um, some of the other events that have also taken place. There is a, a big variety of different things there so depending on where you are in your um, in your journey there are there's lots and lots of support out there in terms of managing anxiety, stress, there's nutritional advice, there's um, co uh, personal coaches who can help you with um, setting daily powerful habits and all of those kind of things as well. So please, please do um, have a look and, and make use of um, all of the resources there that we have put together for you. So thank you again for joining us and thank you again to Sophie. Thanks everyone. Stay well. <laughs>